which will just a tiny bit past one. That should be uh, satisfactory. So this is going to be interesting. Let's uh, let's do the chat window while we're at it. Because you know this is going to be more um, a brief little hello than what's written on the tin. Uh, All right, so here's the thing. Uh, welcome to Wednesday. I don't usually stream on this day. But the reason I'm firing up a stream, even if it might be not like a full-size, full-on stream like I usually do, is because I have hit a goal, a Patreon goal, that has me undertaking DIY live stream, uh, DIY hardware synth making or hardware circuit making live streams. And although I have been busy doing uh, plugin porting and porting 248 uh, plugins to the new format, and although it's kind of a thunderstorm outside, so this, this stream could uh, be blown off the internet at any moment by uh, thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening. I thought I would fire at least the basic concept of the stream right up, even if I don't go for very long today, because I'm not really prepared. What I need to do is stuff like this. The idea here is that I have got a camera handy for me doing some uh, circuitry work. And it looks and acts kind of like this. I'll try to park it somewhere convenient to the best of my ability. I've also got a microphone cable over here. And what we're going to be doing is, uh, let's see, I've never done this before. That's actually a lie. I've done this sort of thing many times before, but I've never tried to stream this before. The idea here is that if I play my cards right, I can drag something like this Ungar soldering station and my soldering sponge has dried out so I'll pour some of my water on it. Spilled a bit of it there. It, I do not believe this is correctly focused but soldering station, as you can see, is plugged in, although the, the cable doesn't really reach. There are many things that I must repair about this situation, but for now, uh, this is going to sit here because I can't put it anywhere else. And the idea is, hey, Miss Mel, the idea is when I'm doing these uh, for reals, we're going to be building circuits out of stuff. Let's grab some tools. Now, I'm not going to stay on for super long necessarily, but I have various things. 
can do here? Let me uh, see if I can't. Oh yeah, that's it's focused really far away. That's a little closer. So here's some of the stuff that we're going to have on tap. And part of the idea of this whole process is to come up with things. Here, this is an example of my large quantity of uh, LEDs. I got a whole bunch of these for the purposes of and stuff. I also have a whole bunch of 200 ohm and 200k trim pots. Oh, that fell down. I think what I'm going to do is just solder some temporary thing together. See, I've got all this stuff sitting in like uh, peanut containers because that's a snack that I like. So rather than needing to recycle them, I'm recycling them by using them as containers for electronic parts. I've got it labeled uh, 200 ohms. My lighting is really poor here. So I'm again, like I said, I didn't expect to get to this stage this early. It's, it's really cool. And it also poses its own kind of challenges. So let's see. This goes back here. Oh, check it out. I have a bunch of this too, which is 10K slide pots. Hang on. Why don't I pick up this light and try to put it down somewhere a little closer to where we're doing stuff? That's probably like right in the way. Eh, it doesn't matter. So yeah, that's kind of right in the way, but that's also the best I can do for the moment. Um, back to our image of things. See, this is what I was showing you before, which is 10K slide pots. I ended up finding a large quantity of these, so I bought an enormous bum load of them. So this is the idea. And you're going to see only a very crude little picture of that idea at the moment. I would prefer to be talking about my plans. And in fact, I will be doing that momentarily. And we're not going to do a long stream today. I just thought I would uh, fire it up on the day that I'm committing to do going forwards and by next week I should have a real thing to do. But what I can do here is uh, show off some of these parts and things like this is a breadboard. I've got it hooked up so that if I attach a battery I've got a uh, power and ground rail. I've also got another thing. Oh, and there's also some jacks here. They're Eurorack style. We're not actually going to be using Eurorack in every sense. Although what you can see sort of to this side, these are the rack frames that I made. And uh, I've decided that this stuff that we're doing is going to follow some of those concepts just for flexibility, because what you can do is um, take these materials and put them together so they can be attached onto a thing like this. You can take the rack screws and, and install it, and that's what we're going to be doing once I have all this stuff sorted in a way that makes some kind of sense. 
This is basically just one minute after I started the cameras rolling and I started the cameras rolling with absolutely no concept of what I was going to be doing. So I'm just going to derp around for, I don't know, maybe another half an hour, 45 minutes and call it a day, but I will have gone live. Also, one of the things I'd like to do is a more appropriate um, image. In fact, maybe that had better be the, the first thing to do. So I could take a screenshot of that, but instead what I'm going to do is go back to our proper camera. Technically, I can move this light over here now. Oop, very proper camera. And uh, I can go camera over screen. Oh, look, we hid the window and then you can't see chat anymore. Now we can see chat. So I'm going to run a program called Clip Studio Paint and uh, open up a file, hopefully, that I can find. Chris Glam shot. Actually, would that even be there? I thought photo cache, uh, the Instagram files. There we go. So essentially what I'm looking for here is um, a particular image or something like that. This is what used to be on Instagram back when I was doing Instagram. And this is the kind of stuff I'm looking to do going forwards in the DIY. See, I've already started uh, earlier versions of that. That's the inside of a Lavery. That's a way to make a, um, a Mac Mini. Uh, draw cooler air from underneath the table by sealing itself off. That didn't really do anything. These are some um, music thing modular. Your rack modules in the process of being assembled. That's a little temporary thing. Pictures for how to attach perf board and stuff onto wooden uh, picture frame materials. So I did a fair bit of this and then decided I wasn't going to stick with it, but it's still possible to do if people would like to put stuff together for really, really, really cheap. In fact, I still have large quantities of uh, the frame stuff. It's just unfortunately the frame stuff that I have is the wrong size. The old Frederick's frames are inset enough that it's actually kind of handy, but the newer ones, maybe not so much. And that's all the Instagram files. So the one that I was looking to use as a image is not either this or this. Let's look at this in a slightly larger format. Somewhat unhelpful seeing as this is not the right aspect ratio, but uh, the same. We can but try. I can't actually see what's on the screen because the light's in my way. Yeah. Anybody wanting to chat in the chat, I uh, will probably see what you say. I'm looking to grab a image of this. I don't care whether it's... Uh, useful size or not, I just want the aspect ratio to be right. And I could probably rotate this whole thing around. Let's try that. Because as soon as I as soon as I make the image for this, I'm going to put it up on the YouTube and have it be my default for this.
I've got I've got false advertising going on. I have the wrong image up because we're not actually doing modular synthesizers right at the moment. I need to have something that looks like what I'm doing. So let's see. Uh, God. Transform, rotate. Where's our rotate? Rotate inverse canvas. There we go. Now, is that good? I think it is because I can read the uh, electrolytic capacitor here that says 1,000 microfarads and 16 volts. That's what this is, is it says 1,000 microfarads and 16 volts. And now I need to take a frame of it. It's also nice that we've got these um, hardwired onto chips things here. So we'll take that. We'll zoom it up to be this size. And we'll crop that. Boom. Now, might be worthwhile to change the image resolution. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what not 1080p is. It's 1920 by 1080. And uh, we'll fix the canvas size next. And now that we've done that, um, recent things have done. Uh, you know what, I'll just wing it. I can save this as a Clip Studio file so it will still be editable once I'm done. I remember I was doing some gradients. Let's see what we get out of that. Um, okay, that's making stuff go to white. I would prefer instead to darken it and use white letters. So we'll try that. I can't see where my mouse cursor is. It might be overly dark. I know what I can do about that though. We will make this whole up. Oh, darn it. What are you doing? We will start that gradient farther up. And then it won't go quite as dark. Still pretty dark. I think not dark enough. All right, let's try more. And that ought to do it over to the text thing. And our color is going to be white for that. I think that works. Adjust this stuff appropriately. Line space it if we can. I think that's a good enough name. Uh, keep having to move everything around. I'm online space, respond. There we go, and it moved itself over, so I gotta move it back. And I do believe I'm gonna have to make that smaller, so let's fix that. I do swear by Clip Studio Paint for stuff like this, but uh, right now I can't even see chat or anything. But I do wanna replace that uh, text, so uh, that image. So we're going to do that. 
I could have done this before, but I'm doing it now. And that's going to be uh, Clip Studio Format in case I need to fix it later. But we're also going to export a JPEG and quickly upload it so that my uh, stuff is no longer under false pretenses. There, enough with that. Maxi, I am just answering that very question, or at least I'm going to try to. Uh, so let's go over to the chat window so that uh, people can see what they're doing. And we are going to hope that the JPEG is the right size. Because we need to change this blurb right away. One point one megs, that's permissible. Alrighty. So I needed to do that so that people could see what was going on. Um, essentially, I just converted the uh, image for the screen. over to this so that I can use this going forwards as far as how we communicate what we're going to be doing on Wednesdays. I have many things to be sorted out and fixed as far as getting all this rolling. But uh, here's the start and you can probably see uh, my little cursor there because I'm screen sharing. So this is a capacitor. Uh, there's another one. These are resistors. And an interesting thing that you're seeing in here, this is something that I built when I was like 20. Maybe closer to 25. Hard to tell. These chips are 4049 hex inverter chips. When I started out, that was all I knew to do. And they are used in the uh, synthesizer filter, the, the WASP filter. They're used in the tube sound distortion fuzz from Craig Anderton's uh, Electronics for Musicians, and that's where I got this. And they are a batch of little... Um, inverters. So once you've powered these, and some of the capacitors are for providing power to the, the chip, ground is on one corner, uh, voltage goes to another corner, and then what we've got is these resistors and things soldered onto here. These are wired up in uh, various peculiar ways to produce what I believe in this case was a equalizer. And it was an equalizer based on these hex inverters. So it was an equalizer where the electronics in there were field effect transistors. They're, they're super soft clip transistors. Like the very, the, the distinction between uh, air windows plugins and these if you have like a drive or 80 clip versus something like density, these chips distort more like what you'd get out of density. And the idea is we're going to be diving into all this kind of stuff deeper and deeper and doing all manner of things. Like over here in the corner, you can see these are also capacitors. They're polystyrene film capacitors. And I've got them wired up in an interesting way where they're kind of in parallel, but there's also a resistance that comes in. I'm, I'm producing a interesting sort of filter that way, which is a high pass filter. 
but it also the it has uh, an interesting arrangement of where the poles are on it. These orange things are tantalum capacitors. I have a bunch of those too, and we're going to be using those going forward. And I'm not exactly sure what sorts of wires these are, but we'll be having wires like this. I've actually picked up an enormous quantity of wire um, that I can just send to people. So I've been doing these things, getting stuff like I've got hundreds of these chips. I've got thousands and thousands of feet of wire. I've got whole bunches of not exactly this cap this capacitor, but one's much like it. And not exactly this capacitor, but one's much like it. Not exactly this capacitor, but one's much like it. And I'm going to try to come up with designs. Here, let's quit out of here and go back to our chat window and all this kind of stuff. And I've already got an interesting question that I can answer. That's cool. Um, and uh, yeah, Bro has a question about the plugins. This is also this is a great day to be asking me lots of questions about things. Because it's not going to be a really long podcast, but I'm woefully unprepared. Like, this is what I've got. My soldering iron is warmed up now. I can show you uh, some soldering, but I don't really have a macro lens setup. I don't have a way of holding this in a useful place so that you can see what it is. Although I think I can focus in pretty close. And I can set some of this stuff in the re relevant places. Like, for instance, this is a potentiometer. This is, an, this is a knob, a slider knob. And the way you put this on, this configuration of potentiometer will fit in the holes of this guy here. If I attach it correctly, there we go. So one way of building stuff is to put things on a thing like this and then wire stuff to it. And if this is the top of the thing that we build, we can maybe put another little piece of perf board and super glue it onto this so that it covers over some of these areas. And this becomes a user adjustable control without having to buy a knob for it because the knob could be like a buck each but each of these are like 10 cents or so. And this material is not a buck each. And this is the technology which I will use for interconnections, which I will use for patching and getting power in there. We're gonna take these and just sort of break them. We might break them in a more clever way than this because the way we've broken this, one of the uh, pieces is able to come right out. And that does mean you can put a thing that acts like a jack into the perf board and solder something to it. And it'd be like, okay, this is, this is now our jack. If you plug something into this, you plug it in like so. But, but it's cumbersome. So what we're going to be doing mostly is finding ways of breaking these into smaller parts without having too many of those stray pieces sticking out everywhere. And when we solder the other side of this, or indeed even just bend it in, in some way, like it's some kind of little tool, bend it so that it doesn't come loose. And then we'll have a little bank of, of things. There's somebody who's actually been using uh, this concept for their new module thing, but they're they're still still working. They're they are working. I don't even remember who it is anymore. Um, not in a Eurorack format, but they are working in I believe a smaller than Eurorack format, but with knobs and things. But they've got this smaller format designed, and one of the things they're doing is they're taking this type of stuff 
IC socket plugs and building them into their designs here, as long as I have to hold this here, why don't I just focus on it? So that's about as focused as we're going to get. So there's somebody out there, I forget who it is, but they've been posting in like DIY synth on Reddit, who's got designs where they've got PC boards and things, but they've got it set up so that they've got these for the interconnects. And I think that's key. That's part of what my system is going to be doing. We're going to put this stuff in and then design ways of patching little cables like right into here. And we've got lots of uh, trim pots. Same deal as with the slider. That if we build the slider into a circuit like this, we can just uh, glue some kind of thing on top of this, like another piece of perf board to cover over enough of it. And we can actually use uh, colored electrical tape to give a nice, bright, resilient color that's not going to wear off with use. On the piece that we glue to the top of this, we can also snip off this bit on the side and have it be a moving slider that adjusts things in the circuit. Or we could super glue a piece of perf board to the top of this. And then rather than needing to use a screwdriver to adjust it, you'll have a little piece of perf board sort of sticking off the end, like a little lever, and you'll manipulate that. And doing that will turn the control, adjust whatever it is that we're doing. The whole idea is that this can be done in a much smaller and more compact space than your full, like real your rack system, and for much, 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 much cheaper. How much cheaper? I said, and I intend to send care packages out to people so that um, if you don't have these parts, and I will show people where to get this stuff, because it'll be somewhat wasteful for me always to be sending things like that around. I will be sending care packages of this stuff out to people. This is just all ramping up sooner than I expected, so I can't be doing that right at this instant. And back to the questions, because we do have some questions. Uh, I'm not using any plugins at all. What I'm using is a little microphone. And it's going into a good preamp. And I would like to be able to like build preamps and things this way too. There is some chance of doing that. I can I can get the kinds of op amps that the Neve Portico uses. The the circuit diagram is available. You can get the circuit of that. And I wouldn't be trying to copy the circuit of it, but I can get some of the active the active parts used for that. It's, it's a low noise op amp, and you can buy it for about two bucks a piece. That's more expensive than the usual op amps that I've got, which I have lots of op amps, but um, it's still pretty reasonable. The price in the Neve is gonna be things like the transformer, and I won't have a transformer on tap, but we might be able to make preamps. So the clarity of the sound is this little microphone or my good microphone, which you see on the plug-in posting videos. And it's going in, it's going through a, here that's visible, Sennheiser MZA 900P, which I'm trying to hold in shot which is a phantom powered uh, lavalier microphone powerer. So this, this works fairly well. And it's being powered and going to a preamp, which is an API 3124 plus. Those are expensive, that's why it sounds good. There is no processing after that. So there are no plugins. There is no processing that's part of the secret 
to doing this kind of stuff. The, uh, what you want to do is get whatever kind of preamp you can get together that is high enough performance that it can do this type of thing. Get whatever microphone, again, um, it's a, a Sennheiser uh, Electret microphone power and I'm not going to be able to see. There's there's no label on here saying which one it is, unless it's on, no, made in Germany, Sennheiser. Oh, maybe it is. Hang on. See this little blue thing? This should tell me. So it appears that the electric mic here is Sennheiser, and it is made in Germany. Serial number 127914, blah, 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 blah. And it, I think it's just the model number. So you're hearing a MKE2 OW or CW, something like that. MKE2 Sennheiser Electret condenser mic. And that's part of why the sound is the way it is is you accumulate enough of the raw materials that you can patch the stuff together, run it straight into like the, the expensive studio grade preamp is going into a Motu 16A. So I could also run this preamp most likely into like one of your cheap little Focusrite Red preamps and it'd be basically acceptable I could run this Sennheiser mic stuff into the mic input of the Focusrite, which I believe powers in 48 volt phantom power, and it would still be kind of roughly the same kind of thing, but the sort of extreme clarity that you get is partly from using a better preamplifier, and that's not something that I built. The better preamplifier is API. API and Neve are basically the name brands for if you want to get top of the line, completely simple, no bells and whistles and tricks or anything like that, preamplifiers. Like what the what the API has is a polarity uh, a gain control, and it does have a VU meter, a polarity switch, a phantom power switch, a pad which is a 20 dB pad, and a switch for each of its little preamps between microphone and a uh, high impedance input, which also runs through the input transformer and stuff, but uh, that's all it has. No EQs, no compressions, nothing, nothing like that. No gates, nothing. And the reason that the API gets away with not needing to use gates, there's a lot of gain on this, but API preamplifiers have very, very, very low noise. And, uh, that's part of how you get the clarity of sound, that, that there's not hiss burying everything. So yeah, let me skip this over. Back to our ALKS. So what we're going to be doing is back to our ALKS and back to showing me another you know, I should get an auxiliary monitor. I bet I can do that. Um, and as far as which camera you're using, if you want the visual quality that I do, get into Blackmagic camera equipment. Because the way that it goes together, I really kind of swear by. Here, I've got, I've got this camera sitting around on a stand, which has a quick release. So let's take it off of the stand and handhold it for a moment. While struggling with the various cables and things. Okay, uh, let go. Cable, please, cable, why? Uh. Moving this thing over here. So, now that I'm all handheld, Here's what you need to know about the video system. One, I can't focus for crud, but oh, there we go. 
So what you're seeing here is the heart of the system. I'm focusing in the wrong direction. Oh, I'm using the wrong thing. That's not the focus ring. That was aperture. So this is a uh, Blackmagic ATEM Mini. Uh, Angelo, I wish. This is all happening too fast, so I'm not ready to actually build something, but that is the uh, image I'm going to use for these streams, which will be happening on Wednesday at the usual time, and usually running for probably longer than I'll be able to today. Although I might go, f I mean, if people have enough questions, since I can't really do anything today. But um, what you're seeing here is the A10 Mini, and the switcher lets me switch between main and aux. The hypno is my little sleepy circuits thing, which sits over here where I can get at it. And I can adjust that. And then this is the laptop input for the coding streams. And the deal with using the A10 Mini for stuff, the reason that doing that and also having the uh, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras of some sort, which I'm based on using those, it's because not only are they basically movie grade, now you could go with the 6K. It, it's possible to get even fancier Blackmagic cameras than this. If you go with the 6K, those are even more movie grade. These are Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K. And that's pretty much, oh, I'm not gonna be having parts for sale. I'll give you parts, but I'll also show you where to get them. So that's the idea. And it's not really kit so much as we're going to be jamming with electronics. That's kind of where the fun is and that sort of thing. So yeah, as far as which camera I'm using, it is a combination of Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. And you can get older ones like pre 4K and they're still damn good looking and should work the way that I use them. And the reason I made such a fuss of the A10 Mini is because if you've got the packet cinema cameras plugged into those and that plugged into the computer, you can do all manner of stuff like, you know, picture in picture, uh, chroma keying, that didn't actually do anything, with a program on the computer, which is called, here, let's, let's do this too, ATEM Software Control. This is the thing by which we do stuff. And the way this works is, let's see now, camera over screen. Actually, I don't see my camera output anywhere here. Um, did I blind? Yeah, I muted it. But there's the camera back. So if I set this to, uh, actually, that didn't do what I thought. So the special thing about this, that we've got the, um, the ATEM software control here. Now, also note that I am not, you can, you can see on my screen there, or at least maybe you can, I'm not sure if it actually shows. Um, I have not been able to capture video to the computer through the ATEM Mini. The software has just completely broken and failed to work over and over. So what I've done is I'm taking the HDMI output of that and going to a simple sort of gamer capture thing. It's a Razer Ripsaw. And that's able to take HDMI and the A10 Mini will output 1080p no matter what resolution you put into it. So the Blackmagic cameras are actually running at a higher resolution than 1080p, but the A10 Mini downsamples them and blends them in such a way that if I even go to like the uh, hypno here and do this stuff, 
See, there's a, there's a system that I was going to be doing for this. I might even have it written down somewhere. But not there. Oh, wait, I know. I have it written on the back of this piece of card. Luna Cam Hypno and Key Adjustments Luma Key Full Source. Oh, you can't see that. I have to move it over. Luma Key Full Source Camera One. Key source camera one. And then uh, I think if we go to, oh, and the last thing is that I have to set this correctly. Don't mind me being a little confused. I have not got this set correctly. Okay, uh, back to me. So this is the kind of stuff I, I deal with. This is a little cheat code for how the uh, sleepy circuits is run. And I do have it set so the video capture from the feedback the ATEM MIDI is going to a Razor Ripsaw, and the Razor Ripsaw is what's going to the computer. And that's part of how the, the visual quality is, because the ATEM MIDI's input to the computer, when it works, is motion JPEG, but the Razor Ripsaw is just basically a frame buffer at 60 frames per second. It's, it's designed for gaming. It is indeed it is indeed capture card, but it beats the crap out of the A10 Mini's like virtual webcam, which also doesn't really work, and the Razer does. So all of that is very good. And what I'm trying to do right now, and because I might as well, because there's nothing really that I can, I'm not ready to do any circuits today. So I'm just talking you through all these various things. Is the switcher, this camera does these various things. And this is more or less the view that I'll have or an even more close-up view of um, soldering together circuits on little bits of board like this, which I have a bunch of those. I'll be sending them away to people and I'll be telling you how to make them yourself. As far as all the hypno stuff is concerned, what I'm shooting for is figuring out why this is just blue. <laughs> Don't mind me. This worked before. So how about re reset this? So there's the Hypno doing its things. And the idea here was to um, switch from this input to the input that allows me to do, or maybe I will do a distortion effect here. This now has the second oscillator as a distortion and as you can see, I can change the color. And this is supposed to be able to get me visuals that aren't just a big raving blank, but also include this camera. So that's what I'm trying to do with the ATEM. So let's get back into this. Oh, wait, I know what. Here's what I've been doing. Is um, 
I've got this A10 Mini going and doing its thing, right? And I've got fill source and key source. And it's taking the output from the Hypno for the camera, but at no point have I ever actually turned on the key. I've just been changing the settings of it. So if I hit key, then it starts to do something. And I can switch to Luma key. And we're starting to get weirdness happening, which is the idea. And then if I mess with things like gain is how much of cam one is being bled through and clip is how much of the underlying thing is replacing the uh Anyway, this is this is my freaky stuff going on here. And it's being done in the way that you can see, like you can see this, this A10 Mini. Here's its settings, software control. And uh, I turned the key on and set it to this. Luma key with a certain amount of pre-multiply. So if there's none of it, I'm bringing it in in the darkness because it's a Luma key. So you can completely replace it. When you completely replace it, it just feeds back on itself. But when I let a certain amount of the camera be composited with this, it's taking the Hypno and then it's overlaying part of this main camera on top of it, and then using the output of that composite as feedback back into the Sleepy Circuit Hypno again. We're going from this to that. And that's where things get kind of weird and freaky. And this is the kind of stuff we're going to be doing in audio with uh, circuitry. Okay, that's just getting aggressive. Also, the ways that I've got this distorted are somewhat weird. Set that to this blur and cause it to wander. So yeah, it's being done by this setting, but I have to remember to turn the key on. And the funny thing is, as soon as you turn the key on, uh, it goes, but it seems to be not responding to on and off very nicely. Like, uh, you can turn the key on and it kind of blinks in and it doesn't really do anything. All sort of weird, but this is the parameter by which I am bringing in stuff, including on my plugin posts and things, into the background. Or you can see it says invert key. That means it brings it into brightness instead. So hi, now I am a special effect, a strange, weird special effect for your pleasure. And we can just fool with this a little bit, seeing as just cause, right? Here's my feedback effect. Oh look, that was actually my face inside my face. There's a video effect for you. I am cyberpunk man.
but I feel like maybe enough of this fun. And let's answer some actual questions and stuff. I'm not sure whether we're going to get any... You know what? It's it's already 11.57. I'm going to turn off the soldering iron because I have nothing here worth soldering together. But let's answer some questions and things. And if all goes well, by next week I will have thought of, like, I could do the tube sound fuzz. Or I could do a simple oscillator. One of those... 40106 oscillators might be good. But for now, I can shut uh, ATM software control off. It doesn't actually need to be running. It's still set up for whatever craziness you're doing like that. I quit the program, but the program has programmed the ATEM Mini to do this madness. So, oh, and that's fun. Here, here's a way of soldering inside my own brain you move it just right and now we're soldering inside chris's head but yeah all good fun hopefully hopefully we can have all kinds of foolishness with that kind of stuff as we get rolling and start doing actual things but for now let me just dial back and answer some simple questions about stuff and I'll put all these little parts that I pulled out just to show people back later. And I'll put these parts, which are things that uh, I can send out to people and raw materials that I'm going to be building stuff with. And I can put those back later, too. So, yeah. The uh, Eurorack... Time to go to, oops, hang on. Okay, can I actually make this shut off now or am I just stuck with doing this? Let's find out. Uh, Coma keying, please turn off. It's very cool, but it's not what I had in mind. Um, never fear, I'll figure out how to figure this out. What did you think? Is is that because I'm soldering things inside my own head? Is that what Christians do? That's interesting. Uh, boy. Okay, HM software control again. We're set up with the upstream key. Do we have a way of turning it off? Chroma key, definitely no worky. Um, well, that's one way of doing it. <laughs> Okay, so there's our other camera. So regarding Eurorack stuff, there's some Eurorack stuff sitting here. Ow. Ow. And if I position this right, it's not going to fall over and hurt me or anything. Um, and so you're not getting a very good view, but I can at least focus, I think. Here we are. So here are questions about your rack. What all does it provide for modules and how do things interconnect? I don't have any handy power cables here. Again, like I said, this is all happening so fast. The the goals that I'm hitting are happening so fast that I'm not prepared. But here's your rack module. And to some extent, I can show off this. In fact, I think a fair amount of these 
are just, oh, I do have exactly what I was looking for because it's right here. Tell you what, let's loosen this so that this goes down, down, down again. Rotate the camera over and let's try to focus so that I can do a nice close up as close as I can get. So here is a, a favorite Eurorack module that I've got. This is a Blue Lantern Asteroid Operator VCF. I really like this guy that does Blue Lantern. I think he's Flavio. Or, um, early on, he did the same thing that Dater Dopfer did. And Dopfer is the guy that invented this entire format. Like here is a Dopfer module. And the way they the way they work is you got your little controls and things to do various stuff and circuitry like this of the kind that we're going to be building some of. I'm going to get a, a better lens for this later so that we can get super, super close up. But for now, this is what we got. And the way that it was powered, how how does it what all this would provide for modules has to do with this bit on the end here, these little uh, pins that stick out. You'll notice that has that. This has same thing, but inside this little shroud, which fits this deal, there's that little pin there, and there is a red stripe on one side, which I believe is actually the negative 12 volt side. And it all fits into this basic concept. Like with this one, what you've got is, you can barely see it when I have the, uh, the macro camera, you'd be able to read this. This little white thing here, that says red stripe. And then this is a little spot. That means when you plug this in, this red stripe here needs to connect to this side of the connector, which means it would go in kind of like this. This is your power supply to the module. Some of these wires are 12 volts. Some of these wires are 5 volts. Some of them are ground. Some of them are negative 12 volts. And some of them in Dofer modules are even wider than this connection and they're like this. Often they'll have this on the power supplies areas. As you can see that's bigger. It doesn't use all of these wires. This is a sort of littler connector. When you have the bigger wider connector and you can get the bigger and wider connector that goes to all of the pins here in a wider cable the extra wires are for buses inside the synthesizer, which you don't necessarily use because the whole point of modular is that you're patching stuff on the outside. Here, let me grab my mic wire and drag it over here for a second, just long enough to grab a cable and come back. This is certainly, the, if anybody really wants me to do a dedicated modular stream, which is kind of what this was labeled at before I fixed the uh, labeling, that's doable. So the whole idea of modular is that you'd be able to plug like this, which is ring modulator X, Y out into this, which is FM in. Modular means you connect stuff like this to stuff like that. And additional things might be making this do something. This is a ring modulator with an X and Y in, and the output is a kind of electrical function. Much like if you had a potentiometer, you could have it be a volume function. You could have X in and out, adjust the knob, and it would be louder or quieter. Or with this thing here, it says uh, 
SHTH in, trig in, and SH or TH and slew limiter and slew time. That's sample and hold, or I guess trigger and hold, I forget. So input is a changing voltage of some kind. And trigger in is what tells you, like if it's sample and hold, every time it hits the trigger in, it switches to whatever the voltage is at on this jack at this moment. It's going to be the same deal for if you're doing this in VCB rack. These are the kinds of concepts that you need to experiment with. And then the output here, you plug the output into something like, for instance, uh, VCR or some, one of the reasons I like this module is it's insane and has a whole bunch of really weird stuff going on in it. So much so that I barely even understand it. It's got a filter. The big giant knob is a filter. Getting these big giant knobs, you can be spending like a couple of bucks on them. So if you were trying to build the enormous synthesizer, you could wind up needing to come up with hundreds of dollars just for knobs alone if you wanted to do them cool like this. That might be a little daunting. My whole my whole deal is I want to set people up being able to play with this stuff without having to spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on it, because otherwise you do. We've got an input gain control. We've got subsonic controls. Those are running off of basically I can't guarantee this is the one because my glasses aren't strong enough for that. Uh, but it could be, in theory, anyhow. When this says sub 1 and sub 2, we could have the signal going into a chip that looks just like this. Or it could be one of these. These are surface mount. These are not. The stuff that I do is going to be based on surface mount because surface mount you can plug into this perf board and poke the, the wires through and it's just fine. This other stuff, not so much. You have to really fabricate circuit boards to do that. These you can just jam with. Poke the legs through the holes, solder stuff to them and go. And this could be, I'm not saying it is because I can't read it, but uh, this could be the kind of flip-flop circuit that you use to make a octave divider in which, and I know what the circuit is, I've made one. In fact, I have one. Here, I'm going to put down my wire for a second. Scampering all over the place here. Uh, what the hell, I'm going to grab my entire pile of stuff and we can talk about that. It's just become relevant as anything. All righty. Enter the danger zone. You can take this perf board stuff, drill holes in it, and put Eurorack jacks on them. These are kind of giant jacks. I got them because they're supposed to be very reliable and they were relatively cheap, but they're not really even as cheap as the, the ones that Eurorack folks generally use. Like you can plainly see, if I unplug this and bring it over, these are jacks, and these are jacks. These are probably going to be more reliable, but you can see they're a lot larger, but they fit the same things. So in, in a way, the ones that I got of this size were quite a foolish choice. But again, I was able to get them for cheap. So I was like, oh, let me get a bunch of these. This is a thing called an Axolotti. It's a little developer board. And if you power it, you can do all kinds of computer and synthesizer things, much like VCB rack in a lot of ways. It's like you're patching stuff together and you're make, making the computer in here do stuff. 
And the audio outputs are here, although you can destroy these jacks and then solder stuff to them. And uh, these are all Eurorack jacks wired right to the input of the Axolotl board with just point-to-point -point hookup wire, which is how I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff. For the purposes of letting the computer in here, this, this was my timing generator for uh, quite, a, quite a while there. Before I had better Eurorack stuff, I was doing uh, sequencing using this. And it also is able to do MIDI out and MIDI in, so I did some stuff with that. It can send a MIDI clock, meaning that I could time other sequencers using that. And I was setting, I was sending outputs like eighth notes, sixteenth notes, a kick drum, the sort of opposite of a kick drum. Bass means like blank beat 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 blank beat 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 for a sort of side trance kind of thing, just stuff like that. And I could program these outputs to do those things by basically just telling them in the programming. So this is another area. This is also, if I'm not mistaken, I have a Eurorack power rail here. And I set that up on purpose. I believe I just used the uh, five volt place on the rail. We can look behind it and see that it is not using the ones on the end, which I believe represent 12 volts. I think this is taken in 5 volts, although I could be wrong. It could be 12 volts and it's just using its regulator to take it down. But it is designed so that I can put it into my Eurorack system and just begin using it like this. And what you do is you plug into the USB thing to program it. So there is another range of possibilities there. This is cables and jacks and things. And remember, I'm going to be trying to use this for jacks. It's much smaller. We can fit a lot more jacks in the same place if we use this for jacks and just lengths of wire to uh, connect things together. The interesting thing about these jacks is that they can handle just as much voltage as these. There are these tiny little things, but they're meant to take the ends of wires or they're meant to take processors and you can put like an ampere of power through them. So they're very, very capable. You can see this is a capacitor inside here and it's just wired in series to two of the jacks. I've got this, this is it here. And you can see the symbol for a capacitor between these two. And one of them has been colored in dark and the other one is light. So one of them is meant to be an input and the other is an output. This same deal, except for this goes through a transformer because I just built that in to see what I could get out of it. Rather than just running your rack signals directly, running it in a more interesting way. And this is, I don't really know what the chip is. This could be one of those uh, 40106s or not. I forget what it was, but this is very reminiscent of what I'm intending to do. The, the, the jacks, not so much because I intend to make stuff work without these jacks with just the, the pin headers. But remember how I said you could take one of these and put it on the board, kind of like this. And solder it to something and then put a piece of perf board on there. Check it out. This cost almost nothing but it is quite possible to manipulate this control while the thing is going. It's reasonably sturdy 
And if it breaks, then just rip it off and solder another one on. That's the connections to it. All point-to-point -point wiring, which can handle heavy voltages. And if I'm not mistaken, this was meant to be like a white noise generator. It was somebody's idea of a circuit for a white noise generator, which doesn't really quite work, but it's a series of little gates in whatever this chip is, all kind of wired into each other with various different uh, resistances. And if you set it up just right, it would start making a symbol-like noisy hiss noise. Interesting point. No power connection. This was to be run by sending it a uh, gate. You'd plug the gate in and send a voltage to it by plugging it from something else like a output. I don't have a good gate output here, but this one does, if I'm not mistaken. Or this one could. Anything that produces a gate output, it's either a voltage or not, can be the envelope to this because it's being driven by literally powering the chip with the voltage that's normally supposed to be a control signal. Now the concern there is if you tried to power a whole bunch of chips, you could burn out whatever is driving it or just starve it of power until it didn't really work. But you know, having the thing not really work because it's starving of power also makes interesting noises. And as you can see, the wiring of this, if you leave off these jacks, is very compact. Idea is being able to build stuff like this into a design Or we can construct a synthesizer out of things like that. Or remember how I said, here's, here's another molt, except for this one has resistors on it so that there is a volume cut between all of these. And this is an example of a, another potentiometer and the difference between Sharpies to change the color of this and bits of electrical tape to change the color of this. Bits of electrical tape, very superior. I found a good place to get those as well and I have a whole bunch of it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be giving that away to people because it's cumbersome to unpeel electrical tape and then stick it on something. But remember how I said subs, right? Sub one, Sub two is one octave down from the input, two octaves down from the input. This is literally that. Here's the input. This one has your like power rather than trying to get the power because it's, it's an input and two outputs, so it does need to get power from here. Nothing but wires in here. The circuit is capable of technically working because the deal is if it breaks, I don't care. This is so simple. You can feed a input in, and if it is a suitable square wave or something like that, enough to trigger this, the way this is wired together serves as sort of a subsonic oscillator. There are no parts but wires in here. This is a very, very basic, simple thing to start with. And then we've got the wires kind of going through holes and along here. And output of our one octave down is here and octave of two output, two octaves down is here. Again, most of these won't be able to work this way, but this worked. I had it in some of my jams. I was, I was running a Moog into it and I was running the output into the input of the Moog, uh, the external input, and I was able to get a, a crude, funky, and glitchy octave down off of just this. There's nothing, there isn't even a capacitor to smooth out the power supply. 
it is nothing but a logic chip. And if I had my better glasses, I'd be able to tell you what one it is. Hang on, I'll get them. I'll tell you another thing. I'm going to want to be able to get better lighting. I'll, I'll figure that out. I'm trying to put on... Give me, I'm wearing glasses and I'm trying to put on my glasses on the glasses. That is silly as anything. But this is what I need to tell you that the subsonic filter is still kind of hard to see. Darn it. Well, you know I have a better way of knowing that. Um, hang on. We're going to be done pretty soon, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> we are. So yeah, this is my instructions for compiling things. But beyond that, I have my notes on other plugins. This is not what I thought I had. Um, bear with me while I try to find the note I wanted. It's around here somewhere. Told you I wasn't prepared. But the fact that this is happening sooner than expected is awesome. Nope. Oh, hello. Peter. Alrighty, this is made a win. So when I say I'm not prepared, that means and doesn't mean certain things. I, I just tried to grab that. I may not be prepared, but when I take something like this and go, this is a uh, subsonic wave generator, and you can feed a square wave into it and get two uh, subsonic square waves out of it. I did, however, take stuff like this and go like, okay, these are the chips that have 14 pins and these are the chips that have 16 pins. One of these is, let me see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. 16 pins wide. You can put a chip across ways here and it'll fill the entire piece of pegboard up very neatly. And dual flip-flop, which is, let's see, if you could see what's on this chip, it would say 4013 because a flip-flop is what gives you that subsonic thing. Unless it's 4024, which is another thing that does similar things, but I think this is implemented as a pair of, of flip-flops, and it's using that. The 4024 is something where it takes in a, a set of triggers, and it just generates a succession of things. And, hang on. See this? Clock divider 2. This is another Dopefer module. And it's very cool. I use this in stuff. It's got a variety of things like gate trigger or CST, which is inverted trigger, I think. It'll do 2128 prime numbers or 228, and these various numbers on the side will tell you what the sequences are going to be. Now if it's doing um, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128, 
That is 4024 octa divider. In fact, we might even see one here. One of these chips might be the 4024. I don't have a macro lens enough to do it. Um, we can't actually read these. And my glasses ain't good enough. Let's try the other glasses just for the hell of it. So this is some kind of little computer here, but these two, what are these two? CD4504, CD4504BE. Now when it says that, CD means this is a CMOS chip, which means it takes certain voltages and things to do its thing. 405, 4504, I'm not honestly sure what that is. BE means buffered outputs. UBE means unbuffered outputs. For our tube sound fuzz thing, we're going to be using a UBE. We're going to be using unbuffered outputs. And this little guy here. Interestingly, let's see, we've got like LEDs and things on. Interestingly, this circuit contains bits that aren't soldered in. There's shapes in there that look like transistors and there's nothing on them. Although actually that might be where the LEDs go. But the other side of it looks as if there's supposed to be something there. So getting back to this, when I say subsonic generator you feed a square wave in and get a octave down and then another octave down. This is how that's done. And the way the other octave works is the output of this goes into the input of that. And they're just kind of in a chain there. And again, no parts. Just a chip and jacks and some, a bunch of wires. This is a very heavy wire. This is ground, but it really didn't need to be as powerful as it is. I was experimenting. And it's a 4024 octave divider, which is what's in this. And there's all kinds of cool stuff. Like there is a delay chip that is quite popular. And it exists in a lot of fancy stop boxes and stuff. And I've got like 30 of them because you can buy the chip for about $2. These are the things, like one of those chips is in one of these blue enter modules. In fact, it's one of those ones that I don't have installed right now, so I can literally show it to you. This is another blue lantern that I'm very fond of, and I've got these wires on top of it. Uh, I built this to plug into it. It takes a, a capacitor and connects two of these inputs together. But this is what the actual device is. And basically what it does is you send in a trigger, which is this here, and it does like a kick drum sound or any number of other weird things. There's a noise generator in here. You get to switch what kind of noise it is, like so. The frequency that you've got, the waveform that you generate can be different things. This is more of a triangle wave. This is no output to the wave at all, so it just makes the noise or whatever. And this funny shape here means this is the triangle wave through some kind of distortion that is rounding it off. It's like a saturation. It's like density or drive or something like that. Changing it from the triangle wave into more of a sign-like behavior, which is not really a sign. Boost is like an output gain. Sub is one of those octave dividers, like the 4024 or something, or the 4013 dual flip-flop. This sub here is the output of such a flip-flop. And this stuff here, it says repeat and time and decay and FX level is one of those echo chips. One of those echo chips that you can get for like two bucks or so. 
I might even be able to spot it on the back. Let's switch over the glasses again. I won't keep you here for much longer, but this is what we're going to be doing on Wednesday, so get used to it. Um, what we have here is a Cool Audio V2164D. I believe that is a VCA. So voltage controlled amplifier. I'm not positive, but this, this one here, I'm really going to need to get a higher magnify, magnification glasses that are more like those little granny glasses so that I can see whether the, this is in focus. Because it's typically not going to be. You can even kind of see where it says PT2399. This is that delay chip I told you about. And you can see it has like full size legs, which could fit onto something like this. I have a whole bunch of these just sitting around. I could, I could mail you one. And may very well end up doing just that once we get rolling on this kind of stuff. The stuff I can't do is all this finer detail stuff. But we're not going to worry about that right now. And as you can see, it's complicated and has a lot of things to it. Much of this other circuit board is all these jacks and wires and knobs and things. All of these things are potentiometers. They're not incredibly expensive because they're so small, but they're still relatively... They're, they're a lot more expensive than the trim pots, I'll tell you that. So, let's start putting some of these things back. And he's coming in for a landing, I think in this exploration. By next week I should have something to do that is a little more sophisticated than, than this. Because this well things get a little crazy. Don't mind me, I'm just being silly. Perception. So, well, that's an interesting monstrosity. Cool. We will call that our final word here. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, here's my reference chart. As you can see, it is a weird special effect. But it's normally a white card with stuff written on it. And I've got a bunch of other useful things like this one, which says X-Acto Knife, 1 16th inch drill bit, a dollar of perf board. This is the way that you divvy up the perf board. Not that you can see that. Here's the thing that says CD4007UB. You can even read what it says a little bit if I hold it just right. I'm going to be taking this and filling in where the various things go, where the various controls go, and where you run the wires. And once I've done that, it'll be possible to uh, make sense of that stuff and hook wires up because this is the kind of thing that I was doing a long time ago. The way that we sort stuff like that out is printing out the data sheets. <laughs> Granted, that's maybe not the most helpful data sheet right now because, yeah, but you can not even slightly read that, but if you could, it would say CD4007UB, which is a dual complementary pair plus inverter, so it's like transistors. And we'll step through this stuff. And I have lots of pages of 
circuitry stuff and the explanations for these various chips that one can use. And I'm quite excited to get in on it. I'm just not remotely prepared, but I am in fact quite excited about cranking into this sort of thing. So on that note, I think we've had about enough craziness. I wonder which things I have here will look really strange. I do have some questions floating around though. So what I could do is switch over to where the uh, graphics is maximally disturbing. And why not? Yep, heat sinking heat missile is a big problem. Yeah, oh, Chris's head has been mutated. So, can I explain where or how I started learning to do audio processing for plugins? Here's the thing. A lot of what I do is just straight up experimental. It's why it's useful to me coding on a older laptop that um, lets you drag a component file into the folder and then immediately launch an audio program and use it, is it lets me do stuff in an iterative way. I started fooling with this stuff a bunch of years ago and for quite a while I really had very few ideas as to what was going on with it. You can start with things as basic as like, okay, here's a series of samples. If you multiply all of them by 0.5, it gets quieter. And that's all well and good. And then if you multiply all of them by something else, or if, say if you if you save a sort of running tally of them, and then you're using the average of the last five at whatever moment we're at, then that is a, a low pass filter of a particular kind. If you keep a variable and then just start combining new information coming in with it, that becomes an IIR filter and so on and so forth. And these are just the sort of beginnings of the, the steps to going through this kind of stuff. I had to sort of do it bit by bit and sometimes I was able to look in on stuff and learn from like the biquad filters was a very cumbersome procedure. The main thing I had here, I'll draw you a picture. Just kidding. Um, the main thing I had was the idea that a biquad filter is two different delay lines. And one of the delay lines is the input signal. So it's just nothing but like, here's the sample, here's one sample ago, and here's two samples that go on the input. The other delay line is on the output. So here's the output sample. Here's one sample to go of the output sample, meaning that it becomes like an IIR filter. It becomes a continuing process. And then here's three samples that go on the IIR filter. And a biquad filter is clever ways of combining all of that stuff together so that you can get more interesting results out of it. Uh, but the maths of it tend to lose me. I don't, I don't follow the maths of that stuff, so I use it in spite of not knowing the maths. Uh, let's play with visuals even more. Whee. So the way I started learning how to do audio processing for plugins was experimenting with stuff and listening to what happened. So that is important. That is a important thing to try. More special visuals for you as we uh, head out for the day. I don't know if that helps. 
because all I can tell you really is I started learning to do audio processing for plugins by doing audio processing for plugins, trying stuff, experimenting with it, seeing what I, what I got and listening to it. Because here's the thing, one of the reasons I started doing this is I was listening to other people's plugins and being really unhappy with how they worked. I'd listen to some kind of filter or some kind of emulator or something like that and go like, okay, that's the basic idea, but it feels like a pod person variation of what that is. Why does this not have the impact, the, the physicality and convincingness of a raw signal? So a lot of the stuff that I ended up doing leaned towards simpler stuff that you could do with sequences of numbers rather than your heavy math stuff. Like slew only filter is nothing but a subtract. Slew only filter is the sample that we've got now minus what happened just before. And that is a very simple thing. But it has its points, you know. Uh, I don't think there's anything further I can tell you about that, sadly. That is just... Uh, that's all I got for that one. But I mean, the audio processing plugins, that's Monday. So I've been doing that for quite some time. So generally on Mondays, I will start with some kind of goal. I'll be trying to do something in particular. And I'll be coding a plugin starting from basically a template form or something that I had before and just going from there. And I will try to make a thing happen and I'll talk people through the whole process and it seems to work like this. It'll take an hour and a half to get something starting to behave the way that I want and then in the last half hour or so things start sounding correct real fast and it becomes a very interesting exploration chasing after what the sound is supposed to be. But in general you go back to my uh, audio plugins and the, the coding streams on Mondays. And that's more or less how that works. That is how I started learning how to do it. And those are my ways of getting an understanding is not from breaking them down in analysis and going to school for them and stuff, but trying various things and critically listening to what the result is in various audio examples in order to try and get the correct sound. So yeah. So yeah, I don't know if anybody has any further fascinating questions in the That's freaky looking. Look, my nose is a black hole. Do I have simple templates available? Go to my GitHub, Air Windows GitHub. I am not good at helping with this setup. Setup is, is not gonna be my strong point, but as far as templates are concerned, I do have that kind of stuff on hand. And you can look at them and hopefully get them working, one hopes. At least that would certainly be my hope. Okay, now let's melt down into cybernetic space. Here, have a window into cybernetic space. 
And on that note, I think we will uh, call it a day. Mm, you're just back. I'm basically done. Yeah, Mondays are better for talking with me about the, the coding because I'll be actually doing it. And that means I can type stuff in that you might be able to look at and relate to. As far as these Wednesdays, these are going to be coding. It's just, I mean, these are going to be, you know. Making these wonderful things. Sparkling with electricity. But today there was very little that I could do. Yeah, please don't have seizures. I suppose I'm not being very helpful with that, am I? There, that's a little chiller. Well, still being downright freaky. Coils 2 is not done yet. I haven't put it out yet. I'm thinking this coming Sunday should be good for Coils 2. I hope so, anyhow. Uh, I do have to make the VST of it, and I've just done all of those audio unit plugins, so. Clearly, I'm, I'm pretty drained, but um, I do have hopes so I'll be able to get that out. Alrighty. On that note, I will bid you folks a uh, good day, and we'll catch up... Uh, with a bit of luck next Wednesday, I'll have something act actually to do, even if it's fairly simple. And we'll just start building on stuff. There's a bunch of things I need to get together, which is, oh bro, don't be silly. Now don't be, don't be one of those folks. We're gonna be on opposite sides of a thing. You don't want that, do you? Anywho, you know, it's like your brain, it's like this. Bzz, 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 bzz. Anywho, good day. We'll be trying to build some circuitry and stuff next Wednesday and in Wednesdays uh, following that. Laters.